every country in the world that's signed up to the Paris Agreement has to reduce emissions. And to reduce emissions and to get to a net zero emissions global economy, which is the aim of the Paris Agreement, we're going to need to generate domestic credits. The primary buyer of those credits has been the Australian Government's $2.5 billion Emissions Reduction Fund, which enjoys support from all political parties. The fund pays farmers and businesses to reduce or sequester greenhouse gas emissions, and it uses a reverse auction system to do so at the lowest cost. The average price to date is $12 a tonne. By 2030, carbon farming could contribute up to $8 billion to the Queensland economy. And it's happening now. Already, the federal government has contracted farmers to deliver almost a $1 billion worth of carbon credits in Queensland. Grant and Carly Burnham run an organic cattle breeding business near Monto in central Queensland. Their 5,500 hectare property, Bonnie Doon, is covered with a soil carbon project. How does the carbon get out of the atmosphere and into the soil? Well, all growing plants photosynthesise and grass is no different. It takes atmospheric carbon out of the air. It's turned into sugars and cellulose. That both goes into the plant structure itself and into the soil to feed the microorganisms. What you do on top of the ground to the plant, it also happens under the ground. So the cattle come in and they're like little kids. They eat their dessert first, which is the sweetest part of the plant. So they they, um, they eat the top off and that, in doing so, they also prune the roots off under the ground. And that carbon gets stored in the soil? That's right, that carbon is securely stored away well under the, under the soil. We're in one of 30 paddocks for this mob. How does the cell grazing fit in? So we'd graze this paddock four to five times a year. We let the cattle in for short periods of time during the growing season so that for two days it'll get grazed and then it'll get 30 day rest. And in the winter, when it's growing slower, we have a four to five day graze period and then maybe a 90 day rest period. How have things changed for your business since you've been cell grazing? Because we're working with the rhythm of nature, we, we want to improve, uh, we want to regenerate. And since we've got cells going here, we've increased animal production through weight gains, consistent pregnancy rates, no weed problems, parasites are no longer an issue. It's making our soils more drought tolerant and it makes us more flood tolerant. We make use of every drop of water that lands on our property and we're sequestering carbon and it's a win-win-win situation for us all. I'm a fifth generation farmer so it's important for me to continue the legacy that my ancestors established in Queensland. I love what I do and I love working the land and being connected to the landscape and the earth. Storing carbon and being paid for it is very important in that it's contributing to our bottom line, which is beef cattle production and selling healthy meat to consumers, people's kitchen tables. And what the carbon payments will um, provide is a more stable sort of economic basis for our business so that we can innovate and take on other projects. And it builds more resilience into our business, just like how carbon builds more resilience into the soil. So we baseline the whole property in the first, um, first year of, we, of going into the contract. And then five years down the track, we baseline again. All of our emissions are taken into the equation and the balance of carbon positive that our business is we get paid on the difference. We should be able to earn $50,000 a year off our 5,500 hectares that we've got in the project. Carbon farming approaches that credit carbon in trees rather than soils are better understood, more common and easier to measure. Not far from Bonnie Doon, John and James Henderson have two vegetation projects under the Federal Government's Emissions Reduction Fund. So this is a good spot here. You can see the, um, the different uh, types of project areas. Out here on this side, we've got what's called a baseline period forest. Uh, that's not eligible for uh, carbon because it's reached its 20% canopy cover. And around here, we've got uh, the area that's all in a human-induced regeneration project. You can see a lot more dead trees from poisoning and smaller trees that'll be able to grow up. 
Yep, so the change in management practices will allow for the, the regeneration. What attracted you to carbon farming, James? So I suppose just the opportunities that it provided for our business and um, the extra cash flow should certainly be a, a, a big benefit to us. If we go over here, you'll get a better view down the valley of it. OK, let's go. This country has been traditionally cleared three times in the past. And essentially, we're getting paid for not clearing it again. So we had to change our management practices by demonstrating that we were ending chemical and mechanical clearing, uh, as well as allowing for regeneration by the rotation of cattle and the continued uh, rest of pasture so that the uh, young eucalypts can come through. So we've got a, a wide range of uh, uh, small mammals on this uh, property. Um, we have uh, the sugar glider, the squirrel glider, the greater glider, and possibly the yellow belly glider, um, as well as two types of bandicoots and some koalas, um, some yeah, marsupial mice and a few other bits and pieces running around. Yeah. Where it's reached 20% canopy cover, um, the sugar gliders have managed to extend their range where they couldn't come here in the past. They can now sort of glide between the trees and it extends their feeding zone, so obviously it'll increase their, their survival chances and their chances of reproducing and continuing the, the line on. With the, um, the extra shades, you don't have the massive variance in the soil temperature, so the, the grasses tend to handle the, the heat waves better. They also handle the cool conditions better, the, the frosts and that. So it's all about extending that growing season for us, so if we can get an, a month either side of peak summer conditions, um, that adds a lot to our bottom line, just on the cattle point of view. Since the rotation, we're starting to see a lot more wetland vegetation through the creeks, which is certainly improving the water quality. So we're seeing reduced runoff from the property, which is resulting in that sediment dropping and being distributed on farm and rather flowing out to the reef. So this project here over the whole property should hopefully generate over 25 years at current market value, but over $2 million. So it adds about 30% to our gross bottom line for the area involved in the project. This is a great stand of Brigolo, isn't it? Is, isn't it? So cool. How rare is this? Uh, it's quite rare now. So one thing you notice as you come into the Brigolo, there's quite a big turnover in the species in the understory. We haven't seen these grasses before today. No, that's it. So we've got curly windmill grass and Brigolo grass, and that's the idea of an ecological community. They go together. Yeah. The $500 million Land Restoration Fund is a new initiative of the Queensland Government designed to support carbon farming in Queensland that delivers additional co-benefits. Carbon projects have to deliver carbon, but they also, by changing land management, affect water quality, they affect biodiversity outcomes and they affect the communities that the project's based in. Regeneration is important for an endangered ecological community such as Brigolo because the area of habitat determines the number of species that it can support. So if you take an area of habitat such as Brigolo from 7 million hectares down to less than 10% of that, you're expecting to lose a lot of species. That takes time, decades to centuries to occur, and if we restore habitat now, we'll keep more species. The Land Restoration Fund is still in development. A lot of big decisions are yet to be made. But the vision that's laid out in the initial documentation suggests that the fund will offer landholders higher prices for their credits. It will be another, another buyer in the market, essentially adding diversity to the industry. Heading north to Babinda on the edge of the Wet Tropics World Heritage Area, Jarrigan Natural Resource Management is developing an innovative landscape scale restoration project that's combining carbon and reef credits to improve the quality of water flowing into the Great Barrier Reef. Reef credits are like carbon credits are for water quality, so they're a means of paying someone to improve water quality. The pilots are us trying out these reef credits because they have to withstand scientific scrutiny, but they also have to be practical for the farmer because they're the landowner. They're the people who have to make the change out of their farming practice to prevent the uh, nitrogen sediment or pesticides leaving their farm and reaching the reef. Or it's about something like a wetland, which once it leaves the farm, it is then captured and doesn't get to the reef. We've got both of those pilots going at the moment. What makes me feel so passionate about this work is that I go back to my mother and my uncle and they looked at the way that Babinda Creek has declined with the sediment build-up, with bank erosion 
and they asked me to fix it. That's what I'm doing here. I'm fixing it because being custodians of this country, I've got an obligation. This is a really significant project site. It's the very first reef credit project in Australia. We've got Alexandria Palm Forest right behind us here and we'll actually be extending that palm forest. That particular rainforest is really important habitat. It's endangered in its own right and it also provides food source for other endangered native species like southern cassowary. So the funding will come from, this is what we hope, it will be a combination of government funding, a change from the way they currently fund projects, philanthropic organisations and the corporate sector who are looking to reach out to make a difference to the reef and an opportunity where the money they will put in will buy them verifiable and auditable long-term change in the environment. Qantas is involved in the project by purchasing the reef credits. So that enables us to actually get the funding we need to implement the project on a long-term basis. Weed control is so important and it's so expensive. The trees have to be planted and maintained for up to three years until the canopy gets high enough to survive above the weed. We want to avoid monoculture so what we do is we collect our own seeds, we propagate our own seeds in our own nursery, and when the trees get big enough, we put those trees into the ground. And over time, we'll be able to connect this piece of remnant back to Babinda Creek and back to the mountain range so that we'll actually have connectivity between the mountains and the reef. We've done a piece of work which in conjunction with a lot of stakeholders defined the roadmap for the development of the carbon farming industry in Australia and we're quite bullish about the prospect of it being a multi-billion dollar industry and the reason why we think that that could be is, is, is for a couple of reasons. One is that we have the capacity and the governance in place to actually generate the credits. We have the land mass and the resources to do that and I think what we're also going to have is the demand and the demand is going to come from both domestic and international markets. And when you put all that together, you have the basis of a potential industry growth with real jobs, with real investment in, in domestic abatement and, and real opportunities to open up new markets.